great pleasure to do this short introduction to the OECD Global Forum on Competition session on Economic Analysis and Evidence in Abuse of Dominance Cases. Uh, in this short introductory talk, I'm going to provide a brief overview of some of the key themes which will be explored in more detail in the Global Forum. Uh, I'll very briefly introduce the economic theories of harm, the challenges of balancing over and under enforcement and the economic frameworks of thinking about abuse and the role of economics uh, in making the appropriate assessment. And I'm going to focus particularly on exclusionary abuse of dominance in this short introduction. Now, as I'm sure uh, almost everybody's aware of uh, uh, who's watching this, the concept of dominance and its abuse in economic terms is, is essentially about having substantial market power. And abusing that position is about exerting that market power uh, in a way that exploits uh, consumers, exploits buyers, uh, and earns prices and profit levels that wouldn't be earned under uh, conditions of effective competition, but also about exerting that position in a way which undermines uh, the competitive process, which undermines uh, rivals, uh, uh, and, therefore un and therefore undermines the, the process of competition and the, the benefits from competition uh, in, uh, in, in ensuring that there's effective rivalry, benefits from quality, uh, better prices, innovation, et cetera, going forward. So an effective regime to, to tackle abuse of dominance is a really, really important part of the competition authority toolkit. And I think in the context of abuse of dominance, uh, as I'll explain, it's particularly important, uh, it's a particularly important challenge facing authorities in middle income and developing countries uh, where abuse of dominance is all else equal, likely, more likely than it would be in very large uh, economies, um, uh, uh, which are, are, are less likely to have firms in a substantial uh, or super dominant position with substantial market power. I'm going to focus uh, mainly on exclusionary abuse of dominance, as I said, uh, and the consideration of likely anti-competitive effects, which would outweigh the efficiency rationale uh, of, of such conduct. First of all, though, let's think about the theories of harm. Now, when economists talk about theories of harm, we're talking about um, frameworks which explain uh, the conduct or allow us to understand the conduct of, of a firm uh, and whether that conduct constitutes an abuse of dominance in the sense that it has the ability to exclude, which means that the firm must have you know, in a dominant position, have substantial market power, it has that ability to engage in it, but also whether it has the incentive to do so. Uh, why is the firm engaged in conduct which is uh, excluding rivals you know, unfairly as opposed to just competing vigorously uh, on, on the merits? Uh, and, and this will depend on the nature of the, of, of the arrangements that we're looking at. Um, so you know, why would it be pricing, for example, below cost uh, if it was a, a case of alleged predatory pricing? And what are the, uh, or why is it entering into exclusive dealing arrangements with customers and what are the efficiency rationales? And then thirdly, these theories allow us to think through uh, the effects of the conduct, whether there's a substantial uh, likely lessening of competition effect, uh, or is it just vigorous competition uh, on the merits? Because of course, competition means you're seeking to undermine your rivals by attracting customers away from them with better, better products and, uh, and, and keener pricing. So we've got a set of theories in economics which we can which we can use to think through the uh, the possible harm that there may be from the conduct versus the efficiency rationales. Uh, and when we're looking at these theories, we gather evidence and we weigh up the evidence and make a judgment uh, based on, on on the evidence in light of the theories. Uh, and in doing that, we can think about it in terms of the uh, applying these tests in terms of whether there's a, uh, a type one or a type two error. Are we doing it in such a way which means that we may wrongly find abuse when it hasn't actually occurred and it's just competition on the merits? Uh, or are we applying the test in ways in which, in actual fact, there is abusive conduct happening, but we are not detecting that conduct uh, uh, and there's a false negative where, in actual fact, we should be detecting that conduct? And so we need to be thinking about the economic frameworks and how we apply them in terms of whether they are erring on one side or, 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 or the other. And this over or under enforcement uh, in terms of how we're applying the economic analysis depends on the probability of abuse and the harm uh, from that abuse. And this will vary by, by jurisdiction, can vary by, by the economy that we're, we're talking about. It's a very important thing to, to think about when we're looking at how economics is applied to evaluate abuse of dominance. Uh, and this judgment particularly uh, that we need to make uh, when we've got all the evidence together, together with the theories of harm. Um, if we've got relatively smaller economies, uh, uh, then there's a greater likelihood that there'll be dominant, super dominant firms 
firms with 70, 80 percent market share with substantial market power. If we've got very large economies, then given the scale economies, inefficient scale in certain industries, it's much more likely they'll have several firms present and we should be more worried about collusion. So smaller economies means there's a greater likelihood of, a, of dominance and substantial market power, and therefore of the ability to engage in that conduct. There may be also um, market failures, such as in financial markets, uh, which go to the ability for entrants and small arrivals to access capital, barriers to entry as well. And these also may entrench uh, a dominant firm's position and mean that um, that, that firm uh, is, is able to have substantial market power, exert that substantial market power, and that the harm for the, from this exertion will be longer lived. Barriers to entry are higher, then that position uh, is likely to be entrenched for, for, for longer. If there's greater openness to international trade, then it means that imports may discipline uh, uh, firms in the local economy. Conversely, if there are higher uh, barriers to, to imports, uh, transport costs, or whatever else, uh, other reasons, uh, then it means that we should be more worried about large market shares of dominant positions in the local economy. Consumer behavior will also have this effect. All this means that there's a greater likelihood of, uh, of dominant positions and the ability to exert those positions in ways which are exclusionary. Uh, in smaller economies, in middle-income developing countries with higher barriers to entry, then there is a very large, uh, large economy such as the USA and Europe. So we should be more worried about exclusionary abuse of dominance and abuse of dominance in general in, uh, in, in economies where uh, there's, there's, a, there's a greater probability of these super dominant and dominant positions with substantial market power existing. Uh, so we should really care about this a lot uh, when we're looking at, uh, at uh, most jurisdictions around, around the world, in fact. And, and in a sense, some senses, uh, jurisdictions like the USA, that you are really like outliers in the sense of the size of the markets uh, uh, that, they, that they have. Um, now, if we look at the economic framework that we're applying in abuse of dominance, we can think about it in two stylized ways, which may be helpful, just to think through the types of conduct. On the left here, we have a situation where there's an upstream dominant firm facing a rival or an entrant, and there's a customer base, a whole set of customers downstream, indicated by C1 to C5, but there could be many more customers here. Uh, and in this situation, the upstream uh, dominant firm uh, faces uh, a situation where it can, uh, it can seek to, to, block, uh, to, to block the rivals and entrants from being able to compete by tying in the customers. It could reach uh, agreements with the customers that they will only deal with the, the upstream firm on an exclusive basis. The rivals and entrants can't, uh, don't have a route to market. They don't have a, an ability to reach the customers. Uh, there could be rebate arrangements, which are loyalty inducing, which could achieve the same effect. Or of course, the upstream firm could charge very low prices. Uh, which seek to you know, induce the customers to deal just with it and not with the rivals and entrants. And the question would be, you know, are those prices uh, uh, predatory, are those under prices um, uh, uh, set in order to exclude or are they vigorous, uh, is it just vigorous competition on the merits? Uh, low prices are generally you know, good for customers, of course. Um, so we've got to think about these arrangements uh, and, and whether they have an effect We've got to take into account things like economies of scale and the ability for us to to create a reputation uh, and the other imperfections that might exist, which may uh, which may entrench a position and its ability to be exerted, and can and, and weigh that up against efficiency uh, rationales. On the right hand side, you can see a situation where the upstream firm is vertically integrated with one of the firms in a downstream market, and so it's a supplier of inputs to the rival downstream. Uh, and so it could refuse to supply uh, potentially an indispensable input to that firm. It could charge a, a price such that the downstream firm is subject to a margin squeeze, not commercially uh, viable. Um, so a range of arrangements can exist, uh, can exist there. Now, of course, in the real world, uh, there's multiple market levels uh, and a range of different arrangements could be, or uh, conducts could be, uh, could be happening at the same time. You could have rebates and loyalty inducing arrangements, uh, exclusive dealing arrangements. Uh, of course, they could be justified in terms of the efficiency rationales as well. Uh, and we've got inputs being supplied. This maybe helps us to think through the types of conduct um, uh, in a stylized way to categorize them. And so when we're looking at it from uh, uh, the, the role of economic analysis, we need to think about it in terms of the actual market situation we're facing and, and understand these markets. Um, and therefore, a case by case assessment is essential. And it's very important to consider two groups of things when we're doing this as well. The first is whether there are economies of scale, economies of scope or network effects. This is very, very important because 
as we saw in the, the, the diagrammatic representations, um, you know, uh, if uh, if uh, if customers are being uh, are being signed up for exclusive dealing arrangements, well, it depends on, on whether the, the rival or, or, or the upstream or the entrant needs to achieve a scale a certain scale in order to have uh, have have low cost to be competitive. So if economies of scale are present, then it makes means that you can, by tying up a, a, a critical amount of the customer base, be able to deny that scale to the rival or the entrant. Um, similarly, you know, if there are network effects provides a, 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 an incumbent with first mover advantages, the rival may struggle to build up those network effects and be competitive, even though it may have a great product, great offering, um, uh, and be a good potential competitor. And we also need to consider whether the set of market imperfections there, so information asymmetries, uh, which means the incumbent can, can invest and build up a reputation, uh, financial market imperfections, which means that rivals or entrants uh, may not have the deep pockets of the incumbent, may not be able to, 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 to finance themselves through an initial period uh, of exclusionary uh, uh, conduct by the, the incumbent. So essentially, there's scope for strategic behavior on the part of the incumbent. Testing this in practice means uh, we've got to take the theories and get the information uh, and, and in a kind of problem solving approach, work out whether the data fits the theories. You can't just have the theory and jump to the conclusion. We've got to test uh, those theories against the information on the market in order to draw inferences. Uh, and these inferences then, uh, based on the nature of the conduct, the nature of the market, uh, can lead to a set of different tests. For, for example, if we're talking about exclusive dealing arrangements, we may think about the proportion of the market which is foreclosed, uh, taking into account, for example, scale economies. If we're looking at rebates, we may look at the nature of the rebates uh, and how those rebates may, may, may uh, undermine uh, competition for the contestable portion of the market, and is there a non-contestable portion? We may think about the as efficient competitor test, looking at uh, uh, and also looking at the prices versus versus costs. But these are these are all tests that we would apply depending on the nature of, of the conduct and the situation that we're looking at. And these are things that we'll go through in the in in, in the forum sessions uh, themselves. In terms of the role of economists, uh, as you can see, markets in the real world rather than a textbook are going to be messy. Uh, and it means we've got to get grips with uh, the nature of these markets, but also with potentially multiple and evolving conduct. There's no reason why a dominant firm, which is seeking to undermine rivals, is just going to engage in one type of conduct. Uh, it's going to, to look at how it may be able to do this in, in ways which may undermine rivals using different types of conduct and arrangements. So economists are really central to the investigations uh, in terms of understanding the markets and understanding the arrangements and how they may be having effects. It's really important that economists are integrated into case teams. And it's really important that the economists are involved in collecting and analyzing quantitative evidence as well as qualitative evidence, such as from internal documents, which may spell out the, kind of the, the rationale for engaging in a particular type of conduct. And that can be assessed versus the quantitative evidence in terms of what actually happened in those markets. So we think you know, a more economics approach or an economics approach is really essential to understanding exclusionary abuse. But I, I want to end up by cautioning against um, uh, this meaning that um, one needs to have an army of kind of expert economists in order to engage in an economics approach. Because this would mean that the younger authorities with less resources um, would not really be able to necessarily engage in, in, uh, in assessing these, uh, these types of cases, typically when you know, private parties um, that they engage would would be would have an incentive and would be uh, would be engaging with with expert economists uh, on the other side. Um, so it's really important that we have a a, a a regime which allows us to engage with the, the core economic theories, bring the evidence to bear without getting uh, with, without it uh, ending up with um, uh, excessive complexity of both the tests and the theory uh, and the analysis of of, of data. So if we do that, then it won't be workable uh, for, uh, for, for, for us as less well-resourced authorities uh, to be able to engage in this type of analysis. And yet those authorities are precisely where maybe the biggest concerns about exclusionary abuse actually taking place uh, in practice. So we need to guard against this kind of this, uh, this, this, uh, this excessive complexity, uh, even though experts that are hired by the parties They'll have an incentive, uh, leading economists, they'll have an incentive, of course, to propose a multitude of different test tests uh, and, a, 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 a very large uh, and, and involved uh, um, empirical uh, assessment. Uh, so we need to have something which allows us to engage uh, and analyze it appropriately. Um, 
there are some insights that I think are important and the background paper discusses briefly uh, from digital markets where um, uh, authorities such as in the EU have, have faced a situation where uh, very complex uh, and challenging circumstances for digital platforms and have proposed situations where the, uh, the firm may have strategic, a strategic market status or may have a position of paramount significance for competition across markets, which means it's appropriate to actually shift the owners onto the firm uh, to, uh, to justify certain types of conduct. And I think this shifting of the onus uh, 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 in, in a situation where the firm uh, is super dominant and entrenched position is something that applies and should be applied more widely uh, in, uh, in smaller economies, economies of middle income and developing countries, uh, like I've mentioned, um, as part of making um, economics uh, uh, effects-based assessments uh, more tractable uh, as part of exclusion abuse cases. So that's a thought I wanted to just uh, leave you with, and I look forward to discussion in the forum itself.